Welcome to Enlightenment of Change on webtalkradio.net. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. As always, thanks for joining us this week. So to help you navigate change, whatever that means for you, whether it's career, business, life in general, I know uh, change could be a challenge and navigating it sometimes the, the water seem a, a little bit rough, right? So to help you on that journey, please take my free communication style assessment. You will get two reports, one spotlighting your natural superpowers. All that means is it'll, it'll explain how people see you, how you're perceived in the world. The flip side, you'll get your lowest score, which will shine a light on your blind spots, also kind of important. So go to WhitmanAssos.com slash CSA and take your free communication style assessment. And I will have that info in the show notes as well. Now, my motivational quote today is by Bob, Bob Proctor. And Bob says, faith and fear both demand you believe in something you cannot see. You choose. Now, over the years, there have been hard times, you know, for me as well, both personally and professionally. So what do you do when you feel lost and just, you know, not really sure of what the next step to take? For me, it has always been about breathing to help me think clearly and before I make any kind of move. Now, sometimes the moves were right. And guess what? Some of them were epic failures. I believe life can be hard at times and not so easy to see the light and what that correct road or what that correct uh, correct path looks like. Today, we have an expert on this topic, and my guest is Thomas Russo Jr. Um, he's the president of Russo Communication, a consulting firm that specializes in spiritual growth and transformation of clients through small group and one on one mentoring and accountability services. Um, he is an adjunct professor at Pillar College, Seton Hall University, Fairleigh Dickinson, and is uh, university and is recognized um, as an expert in organizational leadership and performance communications, nonprofit leadership and management and public services. He's got a lot of depth to him. And he recently published his first book, yay, a memoir of his life experience and how he gave up New Jersey politics and found severant, um, severant leadership as his calling. His new book, there are no politics in heaven represents the human condition and our ability to overcome obstacles and find faith bigger than fear, true inner peace and purpose. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing your, your story. No, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah, this, you, you know, you and I spoke before we were scheduled to, to do the show. And I know that you've really put yourself in this place of vulnerability, which actually helps with the leadership piece of what you're doing and the teaching piece as an adjunct mm -hmm. professor. So first thing, tell us, just tell us about the book. You know, there are no politics in heaven and, and where did that come from? Yeah. So uh, for whatever reason, I was into politics as a kid. So I spent a lot of my childhood very engaged in civics and public service and politics and decided early on that that was going to be my career trajectory. Um, but I also had a lot of challenges growing up too, suffering from bullying and other challenges that made it very difficult emotionally. Um, so I decided early on, okay, government and politics was definitely the path. I wasn't sure. You now at that stage of the game, I think everybody who wants to go into government and politics is either going to be president or a governor because that's all you really know, right? They don't, have, <laughs> they don't have classes in kindergarten about how to be a town manager. Like I missed that day. <laughs> um, but regardless, um, I knew that was my trajectory. So all the decision points academically and professionally and volunteer work just led me to a great amount of success at an early age. Um, the challenge was that politics, there was always this duality of genuine public service and care and compassion for the, the plight of others along with the need for the adulation and the, the, all the ego gratifying things that came because I was empty inside. So I kept ex externalizing what I needed internally. Yeah. It really re um, reared its ugly head the second time I went into politics because I was the youngest ever elected in Parsippany. So I served eight years on the council in Parsippany. Fast forward, got remarried in 2012, got involved here in Bernard's Township where I live library board, zoning board, ran for office. And that's when the slide just started because it just was not a healthy thing for me to get back into the rough and tumble world of politics. And it started to really mess with me emotionally, psychologically, and that's when the demons came and that's when the anxiety and the depression and the thoughts of suicide came until September, 2015, where it was like, all right, I have two choices. 
I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to find a different path. And thank God, God had a different path in mind, but I didn't know what that looked like. So really the genesis of the book was it started out as a workshop for me to work with other people so that they would avoid the landmines that I stepped on in my 40 plus years. But when I showed the workshop to a lot of people that I respected in politics, um, social work, education, just people that I trusted, they all said, you know, this is great, but did you ever think about writing a book? And my answer to all of them was, who wants to hear a book about a recovering politician? And their answer was everybody. And I'm like, okay, well, that's great. So the workshop, and it's interesting, but each section of the workshop became each chapter of the book. So I already had the outline written, kind of written out. So took me about six months to write the book. My best friend growing up actually edited the book. He's the head of the Annenberg School of Journalism at USC. Nice. Uh, very smart, wonderful guy. So he edited the book. We self-published it, sold very well, continues to sell. Nice. And then that kind of opened the door to the coaching and the consulting and the teaching. And I realized that when I closed that d door of politics, which was the thing that I really held above all other things. Yeah. 10, you know, 10 other things opened up right away. So um, the title is funny. You know, people love the title of the book, right? There are no politics in heaven, but the title isn't actually for the audience. I wrote the title for myself because that was my, well, my way of telling me the thing that I valued wasn't going to get me to the next level, right? Or the yeah. next stop. So um, politics was my drug of choice. And I needed to get off of that drug and I needed to recalibrate. And, you know, I blew up my world. Um, seven years ago, I blew up the whole thing. I recalibrated friendships, relationships, finances, health, um, just surrounding myself with di different people, places and things, because I realized that I was living my life the way other people expected Yeah. all these years. And I finally got to the point where I said, Who, who's Tom? And what does Tom value? And what does Tom want to be when he grows up? Because at that point, I'm in my 40s. I'm like, all right, well, statistically speaking, um, my life is half over. And yeah, I've had many accomplishments, but imagine all those accomplishments of education and political success and finite money and all these things and empty on the inside. How sad is that, right? So I, want, I wanted my inside to be joyous and happy and fulfilled because then I knew that would take care of the externalities that I always obsessed over. And I was right. Yeah. So I flipped the script and, and it worked for me. And now I try to work with other people so they can, they can make improvements at any stage of their life as well. Yeah. And, you know, so a couple of, of thoughts to just respond to that, right? It, you're never too old to change and you're never too old to be curious and see, hey, what else is there? Um, the other thing you said that you felt empty, right? You had all this external, you know, quote unquote, looking from the outside, this dude's got everything. And yet inside, you're just an empty vessel of like, this really sucks to the point where, right, you, you get those suicidal thoughts. So, you know, and, and the other thing you said um, that's fascinating, and I think a lot of people live from this perspective of, but this is what I know, this is what I need to do to get those external alkali, um, uh uh, compliments, accolades. Yeah, accolades. Yeah. I couldn't think of the word compliments, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right? All of that. And yet it, it, it's not fulfilling at all. And the last piece is when you made the conscious decision. And I think a lot of people live there, Tom, that's what I'm saying, where it's this unknown and well, it's the way it is. It's my life. What are you going to do? Right. We, we, right. we kind of go through that rhetoric in our brain, but yet I want everybody to really hear this. You said, but when you close that door of politics, all you knew for 40 years, right. Or, or whatever it was, and you all of a sudden, 10 new opportunities came a knock and because you were ready for them, you were open and you, you made yourself you, you um, what's the word like you, you uh, freed yourself from all of that other energy that was was holding you captive, right? Really holding you hostage more. I, I was the one who had the self-limiting belief because yeah. I, I thought that if this, you know, this is my world. This is what I know. This is That's what I'm right. supposed to do. That's right. And, you know, the challenge for me was I'm the fat kid growing up. So I'm the fat kid that's getting bullied and picked on and beat up and made fun of. So that does a job on you psychologically, right? Yeah. So then in high school, between sophomore year and junior year, I starved myself and I lost 100 pounds. So then everybody liked me. But when you do that, it's a very empty feeling because now it's like, now I need to give them what they want, right? Uh. And that's the worst person to go into politics. 
because all the politics did was accelerate the need for you to like me, love me, sleep with me, give me money, come to my parties, whatever. Um, because I needed that hit. It was like, a, it was like a drug, right? I needed the yeah, hit. I needed the fix. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, I think people get stuck in that rut and they say, well, this is the best a marriage can be, or my kids are going to be this, or my finances. Are, and we all do it. And you know, we I all do it. it. Right. I say in the book, we're all going to get on the pity pot, but at some point you got to flush and get off. Like we're Definitely. all going to go through the challenges of the cancer, the finances, the divorce, the kids, the ad car accident, the cancer, the whatever, like you name it, it's coming. Like, and you know, spirit, spiritually speaking, God didn't promise us a perfect pain-free existence. Like, that's, so right. that's, a, that's a misnomer when people confuse religion and how it is supposed to play out in terms of our activity nowhere in the bible or any spiritual text does it say you will not experience pain or suffering no you will but it's the idea of learning how to persevere and push through it right so for me i needed to learn that i didn't i should i didn't need to obsess what connie thought of tom because if i was if i was whole perfect and complete when i was born spiritually speaking and i knew who i was and i was comfortable in my own skin then that gave me tremendous peace. And I think a lot, and you know, especially nowadays, everybody's a wreck. So mental health, economic yeah. health, relationships between the pandemic and just life in general, economically, financially, everybody's shot. And so when I coach people now and I'm, you know, trying to work through things, I mean, yeah, we want to talk about jobs and volunteer work, but it's almost like you can't even get to that point because of how people are suffering emotionally. And, you know, yeah. we, still, we still stigmatize mental health and all these other things. And um, yeah, I just had to get to the point where I needed to confront my psychological demons. And, you know, most people will avoid the pain. And whether it's alcohol or drugs, pot, cocaine, meth, oxycodone, like you name it, whatever we can do to avoid the pain, avoid the pain, avoid the pain. The pain doesn't go away. Like the issue doesn't go away. So right. what I what I had to learn through my counseling, both traditional and Christian, was I, I had to go to the pain. So I, I relived when I did my counseling, I relived every childhood trauma from the womb forward. Yeah. Because that helped me realize why I was repeating certain behaviors or why I was looking for certain things from other people, whether it was male role models or whether it was women in relationships or whatever um yeah. i kept externalizing all these things and then i said ah okay and you know i was raised catholic and then i became a born again christian so even that was a disruption because i i retooled my spiritual thinking because i made that choice like i decided this is the path i want to go on and that's the path i want on. but i honestly the one thing i caution people when i coach them or when they read my book is you may commit to making change in your life, but there will be people around you, especially those that love you the most, they will be the most skeptical because they will not trust that you have the ability to make change that's permanent and long lasting. And you need to push through that. And that, and in a way it's kind of sad because it's when you go through what I went through, which was, you know, I hit rock bottom, right? And externally you would have thought I had the perfect life. I live in a nice, nice neighborhood in Basking Ridge. I'm a town manager. I'm an elected official. I got the wife. I got the two stepdaughters. I got the dog, the two cats. Like, you know, who wouldn't sign up for that? A lot of people would, right? When I'm crumbling on the inside. So um, I, I needed to just say, okay, I needed to be a better version of Tom. How do I do that? And some people were very skeptical about my ability to be the, you know, less manipulative political killer be killed type a that i had trained myself to be which yeah. helped have give me great success in many ways right academically politically but my god it was it was decimating my relationships and my friendships and my health and other things so you know how much what's the price that you want to pay to win yeah and i realized i didn't have to pay a price to win right i could i mean I have crazy success now that I didn't even contemplate seven years ago. So we're the ones who have these self-limiting, you know, things that go on in our head. And there could be so many opportunities out there that people miss because they don't want to take them. I and you talked about faith and fear, right? Because they don't want to take that leap of faith that they can push through things. So, Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, you said a couple of things that I, I just want to kind of comment on the, um, 
the limiting beliefs. We hold ourselves back because we don't know a better way. So I do think that your book and you, you know, being vulnerable and sharing your story can help people pull away maybe what their next step is, right? That one net, that one little step that they can make to create the change. The other thing I wanted to comment on is people. There's always people around us and you can't do that. Why would you do that? What if it doesn't work, right? All of that negative kind of rhetoric that we hear. A lot of that, I don't even know that it it could be reflected on what they think of us, but I think oftentimes it's reflected by what they think of themselves and they're projecting it onto us, right? So I get asked the question, I turned 60 last year and I created a whole new division during COVID within my business, right? That I never even thought about tech driven, who the heck, you know, like I am not, people that know me, Tom are like, yeah, tech and con, not, she breaks things, right? But, you, you know, create, yeah. um, the demand was there, you know, the door opened, I thought I could create this. And people said to me, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you slowing down? And my response at first was like, what's wrong with me? And then I thought, but no, people need my help. I have to do this, right? right. Like I have to create this stuff. So b- because I had the desire to help and serve right. that, that was louder than them saying like, what the heck's wrong with you? Why aren't you slowing down and looking to retirement? I don't know that I want to retire. You know, why, what- why would, why would you want to? Right. Would, because yeah. And, and if and you here, love what you're doing, here's some thoughts. Um, so people told me I couldn't write and publish a book. And it was a bestseller on Amazon. Um, People told me I couldn't do consulting or coaching. So I do the consulting. I do government and nonprofit consulting. And the coaching, I do one-on-one and I do small group. And I actually just yesterday just got my trademark finalized for my coaching program. So I have a trademark proven coaching program locked in because I took everything that I learned through my seven years of hell. And I turned it into a coaching program. So, because I knew I, I figured out what worked. Like I came to this through my pain and my journey. So I said, I'm going to trademark this program. I'm going to create this program. And I got the trademark yesterday. Uh, Thank you. Teaching. I teach 10 classes at three colleges, not at the same time. That would kill me, but (laughs) right. No joke. So at pillar college, I teach human resources, organizational communications, project administration and management, administration and management. Seton Hall, I teach history of the nonprofit sector, leadership and management of nonprofits, local county, state government, New Jersey, and comparative international politics. And then I teach organizational behavior at Fairleigh Dickinson and human performance. I wasn't teaching anything before four years ago. And I did some outreach and I said, this is, what, this is how it worked for me. And it's not, it's not that I'm special. It's just, I'm putting these tools into play. And I think other people can do the same darn thing, which is, all right, well, what are the skills that made me successful in politics, right? Well, empathy, compassion. Okay, I know how to run a town. Yeah, I'm good with budgets. Okay, the practical stuff. But behind that is what? Well, um, the ability to connect with people, public speaking, obviously. Okay. So I, and you know, for me spiritually, I did a lot of prayer and said, all right, I know I'm, I'm I'm putting politics aside forever, which was a painful thing for me because yeah. I always had ambitions to move up the ladder and do yeah. the thing. And I said, well, what are the skills that made me successful and how can I retool them into other things? Yeah. That became the coaching, the consulting and the teaching. And in a way it wasn't that much of a stretch, right? If you think about it, yeah. I still had to consciously think about it, talk to people, pray about it, whatever and create the LLC and write the book and get it edited and get it published and do promotion and have the four uh, social media accounts and do you know interviews with people like you. Like you got to step outside that comfort zone. And it's not like, it's not necessarily easy, but boy, is it fun as hell. Like, and, <laughs> Amen. and, you know, and oh, by the way, I run a town for a living full-time. Like this is not even my full-time job. Like I run a town 24 seven. So, but everybody's got that passion. I'm telling you, everybody's got it. And, you know, the thing, the image in the book, that's my favorite because I'm a visual guy is, is the prism, right? I always talk about the prism. Like everybody's been given a gift or a passion, but you got to do something with it. And too many people, and it sucks, pardon my French, but it sucks because I know too many people that say, well, you can't make money doing that. Or my dad told me, or my mom, or this, this authority, so-called authority figure told me, I shouldn't do blank. 
And then they spent their whole life doing crap that they hated and they're yeah. miserable nine to five or whatever. Yeah. And if you ask them, you say, you know what, what's your passion? Oh, well, you know, I love flowers or I love, I love pets. You know, I love animals or I love music or I love art. And a lot of times it's, it's those kinds of fine arts, performing arts, things that are very creative where some, or some dumb nut said to them, well, you know, you can't make money doing blank. And it just killed their entire life. How sure. sad is that? It is. You know, it's interesting. Um, I find the the younger generation, you know, my generation, I'm a baby boomer. And when yeah. they meet millennials or they have millennials on their staff say things to me like, you know, those millennials and it's a negative. It's that they're not saying yeah, that uh, with, right. you know, kindness and love. Yeah. It's not a respectful right. comment. And I, I, I pause and I think, yeah, check these kids out, man. They're courageous. They're fearless. They do these side hustles. Some of them say, you know what? I don't want to go in corporate. I love painting. And I, maybe I don't have a name yet, but you know what? I'll be a barista at Starbucks. I'll, I'll stock shelves at night at the food store and I'll be able to do my paintings and see yep. where it goes. Yep. That's fearless to me where they're, they're, they're not pushing down their dreams and desires because society says, right. Or an authority, like a mom and dad says, you should do X, Y, Z. And the other thing I just want to share, um, research has done, uh, you know, doing a lot with neuroscience and stuff, but this research I found fascinating, you know, we have, like you were bullied as a child and you had a, you had a rough run of it, right? Yep. All of those things impact how we see the world now as adults, right? And some of it is from the child perspective. And I know you probably have done work with that. Yeah. Well, now they're finding with work with mice and the research that we are handed uh, beliefs that probably aren't serving us anymore, but beliefs and feelings and emotional uh, charges and probably weight to us, right? Energetic weight from 14 generations, Tom. So it's not even like you said, you know, I had a crappy childhood and, you know, all some of the things sucked. Well, yeah. we have our own lifetime things that we're working through, but now we have 14 generations of crap, crap. we need to work through. So this whole journey of life, yeah. and you said it at the onset, going to be good days are going to be bad days. And, you know, nobody was promised to walk in the park because that's just not re right. There's no utopia. There's no reality. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting because we do have to muddle through our own crap, but then we have our ancestral stuff that we bring to the table that we're not even aware of. It's fascinating. Right. The whole thing, yeah. the brain is fascinating. Oh yeah. No, there's a lot that, that there's a lot that's going on up there that we don't realize. And the other thing that yeah. came to me when we were talking before was, um, I spent my, so I've been in public service. I just started my 25th year. Great. Um, so I've spent half my life in government and politics and nonprofit yeah. and the whole thing. Um, a good part of that career, you know, I would say, especially with the elected office stuff, not as much the appointed. I've been very good with the, my appointed professional career, but with the elected office, oftentimes it was, what can you do for me? Yeah. Okay, it's politics. It's transactional. Yes. Connie's going to vote for me. Connie's going to donate money. Connie's going to put my sign on her lawn, blah, blah, blah. Right. And when I went through my hell journey and came through it, I, I really came to the servant leadership model of, I realized that if I serve others and do it with you know, genuine concern and compassion and love, yes, that, that's all I need. Like it always, and you know, spiritually speaking, it always comes back. It always comes back. You do the dance, right? It's well, you wanna, whether you want to call it law of attraction or whether you want to call it karma or whether you want to call it whatever, whatever faith or spiritual system you have, it works. So even my employees in the full, my full-time job, you know, as a town manager, I have very formal authority, right? And, you know, a lot of people, I'm a CEO. I'm the chief executive of a $20 million business. Cool. Um, it just happens to be a town and I have 150 employees. So everybody knows, I mean, my name's on the door. Like everybody knows I'm the boss. I'm, I'm where the buck stops. Even though I have a governing body and a council, in that form of government, um, they hire, it's like a board of directors, right? So they hire sure. the CEO. Okay. Um, and I used to leverage that formal authority very heavy handed in the beginning because it was like, okay, Connie, in the end, my name's on the door. So you're going to do what I tell you to do. Okay. Yeah. And I kind of pushed that to the side and said, okay, how do I focus more on informal and focus more on collaboration and focus more on what does Connie need to be successful? Because if I help you be successful, training, education, 
the fun stuff we do in the office, the, the, the collaborate, you know, collaboration, the team, whatever team building. If I focus on those softer things, I'm going to get the best out of you. You're going to want to come to work. You're going to take a bullet for me. Like you're going to think this is the greatest place. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to be the heavy handed guy. I don't have to be. So just that servant leadership mentality, which for me, you know, is faith-based for other people. It doesn't have to be um, totally changed even my work style and my productivity and just my peace. Like, and you know, I don't proselytize at the office, but everybody there knows I'm a born again Christian because of how I live and how I act. And that, yeah. that to me is pretty cool because that shows I'm, I'm practicing what I'm preaching and I'm living the way I'm supposed to. And um, I just think a lot of people don't have that congruence that, you know, they have the public life, they have the private life. Um, they have the unhappiness at home. They have the happiness at the job or vice versa. And it's like, man, life is, life is short. So you got to be able to push through things and build better relationships. Um, and that's why I like my coaching program and some of the other things, or, you know, all the work that you're doing. Like, I just think we have a responsibility to lift other people right. up. And that's you know, the challenge for me with the childhood. It's sad for me is because um, it affected my ability to have really healthy relationships. It affected my ability to even want to have kids. Yeah. And, you know, thank God for my stepdaughters, because I think that was God's way of saying, look, I could do it. And maybe I was just going to do it in a different way or a different path. And it's been a blessing, right. but um, I never really expected that to be part of the plan. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I do. You, you just said a couple of important things again, Tom. I just want to kind of unpack it. Um, your pet, like I have two kids, they're boys, right? And they're grown men and you, you just, but you still have kids. So it, it, the, the path can be, can be varied depending on our journey, right? And each of our journeys is very different. The other thing I want to say is you were transactional. Can you put my, my uh, sign on your lawn? Will you vote for me? Can you donate for me? Very transactional and it's hollow, right? And I oh. teach, it's funny with, even with sales, you, yeah, you could do a transactional business, a transactional relationship. It's a one and done. Thanks. You know, slam, bam. Thank you, ma'am. See ya. Right. Where's that getting? And how is that serving when you start to step back and say, we, who are you client? How really can I help you? And maybe the answer is Tom, you don't need me. You don't need sales. You know who you need to meet. I need to connect you with my marketing person. Right. That's really where your business is off. It has nothing. You're good at sales. You don't need me. So right. sometimes serving is forfeiting the money, but you yes. do the right thing. And it goes back to what you say. As soon as you start doing the right thing, it comes back to you awesome. exponentially because you're opening yourself up for goodness versus I, I'm not going to send them someplace else. I'm going to try to make the sale because it's transactional versus relationship building. Life is about relationships and the more harmonious we can have relationship with those around us. And by the way, not such an easy thing because some people suck in the world. Right? <laughs> it's true. It's, and we some, people some people are a challenge. Some people are a challenge. Right. People are into you're so cute. Our challenge, much nicer than Connie today. But so relationships, I'm not saying are a walk in the park, but no. I will tell you it's the most rewarding thing. And I just want to share one thing. I remember one of my okay. first jobs, I was at a bank. I was probably late twenties, maybe early thirties. And a gentleman I worked with, it was a joke because I'm very competitive time. So I always had to be number one in the bank with my sales results as a financial advisor. And this, my, my boss, the guy I re reported to, I, I just wanted to beat him so bad. I didn't want his position, heck, heck no, but I wanted to beat him to say, dude, I, I got what you got and more, right? It's a little competitive. And one day he said to me, I, I always beat him by the way, about 90% of the time I beat him. Just, just my listeners want to know that, I'm sure. They're like, did you beat him, Con? Of course I, I did. Say. But here's the, here's the cool thing. One day he said to me, do you like everybody? And you know what, Tom? <laughs> no one had ever asked me that. And I paused <laughs> and I said, yeah, I do. Because let me just tell you, you never, I never know who I'm talking to. I never know what they're going through. So I just come from a place of kindness and love and everything I do. And I really do like everybody because they're not really affecting my life. Right. Unless I, you know, I married my husband, obviously he, he affects my life, but we forget that just right. showing kindness, people are right. going through crap too. And by you stepping up and, and being the first to, to lend a helping hand or an ear, like you do the coaching, right? Or right. teaching the kids about better ways to learn and, and utilize their personal skills. Right. It matters. And that's transaction versus relationship. I go relationship every time. So, you know, in the, 
and you know we're all guilty of the cell phones and all yeah. the wonderful things social media yes. and we're kind of losing our sense of humanity in yeah. the process right so that's yeah. one thing so if you can be that like you said kindness and love and be that type of person man you're going to stand out nowadays honestly and maybe it's kind of sad but it's like you're going to be mm -hmm. the unicorn because you're going to be like wow that person's nice they're friendly what's wrong with them right it's it's a it's say and you know i told this to my daughters um you know and i i mentioned this when i do my speaking i say look i, I was the kid at a young age who had the, the high iq right they do the test when you're young and you're like sure. All right, you're, you're the anomaly you're the freak so now you got to go be with the smart kids and do newsletters in fourth grade cool so i had the high iq i did that's when i still have the newsletters actually and i'm still doing newsletters today which is i love amazing. it like 40 years later, I'm still doing the same stuff. So, okay, so high IQ is great. But I tell my daughters and I tell everybody, please, for the love of God, focus on EQ. Like I'm begging you to focus on your emotional quotient because Absolutely. you don't want to be the smartest person in the room that nobody wants to talk to or work with. That's right. That's right. You want, you want emotional quotient, like you said, it's all about relation. We're relational. We're, we're meant to be tribal as humans so we're meant to interact with each other and my god there's some people and yeah no offense to the millenniums millennials some of them can't interact with humans really well because they're so caught up in TikTok and snapchat and all the garbage yes and it's like yes. my god like be able to have a conversation um and when you have a conversation it's not all about you ask people how they're doing and and mean it like not hey how's your day going oh it's fine no, no that's bs like really how are you doing like what's going on Yes. You, like you said, you don't know you, your interaction might be the best part of somebody's day. And you're like the, the guy you give the $2 tip to at the gas station or the person you're nice to at the Starbucks or the person, the student that I you know talked to after class ended or whatever, just to give them that extra time or whatever. You don't know that little interaction makes somebody's entire day. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's funny. I, I, we're out of time, but I just want to I just want to comment on that because I do think it's important. You don't know. You don't know how you're affecting that person. I remember um, I was a regional sales manager for a bank and I had quite a few branches that I was responsible for their sales results. And so I had a ton of employees, you know, uh, 500 employees or something. And I remember I was out at a local diner with a friend and my back was to the people who were sitting behind us. And as these two young ladies were leaving, paused at our table, you know, and you kind of look up like, why are you stopping? And she says to me, I knew it was you, Connie. And now I'm thinking, oh my God, I know this person. Uh -oh. <laughs> Who are you? So I said to her, you're familiar. I said, but we haven't seen each other in a really long time. I don't, I can't place where I know you from. And she went and reiterated. And I said, I know exactly the branch. I know, I know exactly who you are now. And she looked at my friend and she said, you're lucky to be friends with her. It was the cutest thing. Aww. And my friend said, oh, they, yeah, I agree. I love Connie. <laughs> and she says, let me tell you, she, goes, she used to come to our branch. And I was the boss, right? I'd walk in and I'd walk over to the teller line. Hey guys, how you doing? How's your, how was your son's uh, hockey game? How was your daughter's whatever? Mm -hmm. I knew everything about my employees. And then I'd go and I'd do what I have to do. And I'd inspire them and say, hey, your numbers were great. I was looking, I'm so proud of you last month. Look at, and there was always a positive interaction. And she said to me, you would leave and we would go, oh, we needed that Connie injection today. <laughs> I had no idea. Tom, no one ever told me. I had no idea. <laughs> 20 years later, this, this woman tells me this. It, it, it had me, I was in tears. I said, oh, I'm so glad I had that effect on you. You right. never know how you're yeah. impacting people, what they're learning from you. And that years later, they share the impact you had. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Again, transaction versus relationship, relationship every time. That's it. Yeah. Tom, thank you so much for number one, being vulnerable, sharing your story. Number two, the book, um, there are no politics in heaven, baby. Uh, I love the title. I love that you did it for yourself because it's a cool title, by the way. That was one of my questions uh, yeah. was going to be, all right, why'd you pick this title? So thank you for answering mm -hmm. that through our conversation. But um, guys, I do think you need to check out Tom's website. So go to Thomas Russo Jr. for Jr. Dot com and or email him directly at Russo Communications 
plural at gmail.com. And there is going to be a free gift. He's going to uh, send me the link. I will put that in the show notes. So make sure you, you check it out. Um, it'll just be a little cheat sheet of some sort or good information for you to maybe take one baby step forward. Um, Tom is all about serving and giving. So it's going to be an amazing thing. I will put that in the show notes again, Thomas Russo, Jr. 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 Not junior spelled out.com. I will put all that in the show notes. Tom, it's so nice seeing you again. And, and thank you again for really just sharing your wonderful story and um, change is possible. That's it. It's never too late. It's never too late. So yeah, thank you for that message that came across loud and clear and um, be fearless. Yeah, I love it. Thank you thank so you much. Oh, yeah, real you. pleasure. And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build and discover together. No matter what change you're going through, whether it's personal or professional, I hope guests like Tom today inspire you to take action, to hear the information. It's wonderful. Information is wonderful. Taking those little action steps and some of the recommendations that Tom made today, I hope you can utilize them in your life to move the needle on change or to choose change in your life that maybe you've been on the fence or on the sidelines thinking about. Um, so again, I'm, I hope that today's show inspired you to take action. Um, action is where we get the magic in life. So um, again, I hope Tom helped you with that. You've been listening to Enlightenment of Change on webtalkradio.net with me, your host, Connie Whitman. As always, I am honored to have you on this journey of change with me. And I hope the information that we provide on the show um, helps you in your navigation of change in your life. Thanks again, everybody. And I'll see you next week. Have a great one.